Hello. Good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Let me know if you can hear me okay, if the sound is coming through. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I always like yes, to check did. because you never know day to day if uh, the sound is uh, working or not. So I want to go ahead and uh, jump right into it, guys, this morning. Uh, just a reminder, tomorrow we're going to have our second review. It's going to be our second of third review. So um, hopefully you've been having a chance to not only look at some of the examples of the figurative language that you're using in your own um, in your own work, in your own poems, but also looking at additional examples um, that uh, can be found online. Again, I think one of the easiest ways to become familiar with the, these different examples of figurative language is to provide one or two examples, kind of have them either in a notebook or on, on your device, and uh, look at those examples frequently. If you can use examples that you've heard before that are familiar uh, to you, even better, right? So that you can learn to associate those examples that you've already heard uh, in terms of what kind or what type of figurative language it is. So tomorrow we're going to dedicate uh, tomorrow's class online session to uh, doing our second figurative language review. Today we're going to introduce the sonnet, and I want to give you some time today to begin thinking and uh, drafting up your uh, your first few lines. I'm going to share my screen, and I had a chance to look at uh, some of your posts in the virtual classroom, and I left some comments. I think I left comments uh, to everyone who posted. Uh, again, this is meant to... Uh, allow you to reflect on the person, like who, again, this person is in terms of why he or she is praiseworthy. It could also be an animal or something related to nature, of course, as well. But for you to be thinking in terms of some of the question words, what and how and where and when this person uh, or this thing has become significant in your life. So... Um, feel free to share whatever you're comfortable with sharing and uh, think about, put a lot of thought into uh, the object of your sonnet. Since we're going to be spending several days working on this, we want to choose someone very or something very special to us so that um, it really drives us and to through the, the whole process, through the whole writing process. Um, and I just wanted to clarify also that you can choose any person, any family member that you that you wish, right? This is completely open, and there's no, uh, yeah, you can choose whomever you want. I think I did suggest yesterday, if you're writing about parents or you're writing about more than one person, that you pay close attention to how you want to talk about, let's say, two people, how you want to talk about both in the poem, how you want to represent both uh, of those of those people. Um, so it certainly can be done, um, but I adds a slightly uh, another level of complexity to it. And again, I'm, I don't want to discourage you from doing that. Go for it. Um, but you uh, you might want to pay close attention to how you introduce uh, both of those. And again, the idea here, especially if we're talking about a person, you know, hopefully, this is a poem that you'll want to read to this person, right? Of course, this this is why we uh, develop sonnets, especially when we're thinking about a person, is so that we can demonstrate this person by reading uh, and uh, to the person uh, personally, right? So hopefully, if you've chosen a person, um, you know, hopefully you'll take advantage of sharing this poem with your uh, with that significant uh, individual. Right, so today we want to look at the sonnet, and it's it's a, a little bit more complex because for number one, the length. Number two, there are different aspects of the poem that we have to kind of think about 
at the same time. And that's what makes this difficult. This is what I want to talk about today and um, give you some tips, hopefully some strategies here to think about when approaching your, your sonnet for the, maybe for the first time. Um, so look at, we're going to take a look at this video. I'm not going to play the whole video because it's about 10 minutes. I think it's a little on the long side to watch the entire thing during class. But I want to take a couple of key points from here, and then um, you know you can certainly look and watch the video uh, on your on your own to get all the details here. But if you look just from this thumbnail, there are three main aspects of the sonnet that we need to try to contend with that we need to do. And this is in no particular order. At the top, we have the rhyme scheme, and we're going to look at what that means. So we have to, uh, we're going to have to rhyme like what we had to rhyme with in the the limerick. We had a specific pattern. We're going to have a specific pattern for the Shakespearean sonnet. Now it's important to notice. I'm going to say sonnet, and maybe sometimes I'll say the Shakespearean sonnet. For our purposes, we're going to develop a Shakespearean sonnet. There are different types of sonnets that are available, that are doable, but we're going to uh, focus on the Shakespearean sonnet. So when I, I may use the term sonnet by itself, but I mean the Shakespearean sonnet. So we have to rhyme. So we're going to have a specific rhyming scheme. We're going to have what's called iambic pentameter, and we're going to look at that here in a second as well. And this has to deal with stress. So just like what we had to deal with with the limerick, da 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 da, right? We had that that um, that stress pattern. We're going to have a very specific stress pattern for the sonnet called iambic pentameter. And finally, the content and the structure. And we'll look at that as well. We're going to look at the specific content and basically looking at two different sections of the uh, of the sonnet for for our purposes. All right, so I'm going to forward a little bit here to certain parts of the video. And again, they're saying these are the three requirements, and we're going to look at these three more specifically yes and he's basically saying we have to juggle all of these together we have to try to do all of it at the same time so let's look at the rhyming scheme so this is i think the easiest way to think about the rhyming scheme now the sonnet is going to have 14 lines you'll notice we have here a group of four lines and a second group of four lines a third group of four lines and then a, uh, a group of two lines. Now, before we th we were talking in terms of a five-line stanza, a stanza being five lines of a poem, in the sonnet, it's a little bit different. We're going to think of uh, these four lines, and we're going to call these four a quatrain. All right, so we have basically three quatrains. If you want to think of quad being four, right? We've got three quatrains. And then the last two lines down here is called a couplet. So I may ask you, well, take a look at your second quad train. Right? I'm, re I'm referring to this, or your third quad train. So three quad trains, one couplet. Okay? And this is very specific to the, to the sonnet. Now, you'll notice in the first quad train, we have the rhyming scheme, A, B, A, B. What this is referring to is the last word of each of the lines. Again, a sonnet has 14 lines, right? So we have four times three quatrains, that's 12 plus two, 14. So the first quatrain has a rhyming scheme. The last word of each line should follow this rhyming scheme, A, B, A, B. So the first and third lines must rhyme, and the second and the fourth lines must rhyme. The second quatrain C, D, C, D, now we have to deal with uh, the first and third line of the second quad train rhyming with the uh, first and third line, sorry, rhyming with each other. And lines two 
and four of the second quad train must rhyme. Now notice here that these are different letters, which means that they're different words, they're different uh, sets of rhyming words. All right, so this this automatically now becomes more complicated because it's not, we're basically saying we any word that you have here with A and B, we can't rhyme, we can't choose any more words that rhyme with those. These have to be different words that rhyme. All right, so we have C, D, C, D. Quatrain E, F, E, F. Again, the first and third lines must rhyme, and the second and fourth in the third quatrain must rhyme. Finally, in the couplet, at the, the last two lines, we need to find in other words that rhyme, but they rhyme with each other. All right, so this is going to be the rhyming scheme and i'm going to give you a, a tip a strategy to uh, consider at the end here to uh to maybe help with the rhyming scheme of the sonnet since it again it's rather long it's 14 lines and it has a lot of different types of words that must rhyme with each other okay so this is the rhyming scheme this is one one of the aspects one of the three aspects that we need to contend with when we write a sonnet Here's an example. Believe Eve, round sound, soft aloft. So use, if it does help, use the website for rhyming, right? That's, I think, useful. I don't think it's a, a perfect tool. Maybe it will give you some ideas, um, but, but make sure that you're uh, comfortable with the way that the words are pronounced and choose easy words right notice these words here these are fairly basic words try not to get into three and four syllable words uh, it's just it just makes it more complicated all right so we have so many different types of words that rhyme i think you have a lot of different options and one of the strategies we talked about before is making uh, a, an association a word list that uh, that rhyme with each other. So maybe you categorize different words based on how they sound, and then you can pick and choose certain words from those lists to kind of insert them into your, uh, your poem. I look at uh, a poem, especially a sonnet, kind of like a puzzle, because we've got all these rules and we've got to kind of fit the words into these spaces according to the form but also in a way that's uh, meaningful, right? So it's kind of, I look at it kind of as, as, a, as a puzzle. So if it helps to create those word lists, use those word lists, because sometimes just by having a, a list of words, sometimes the, the story, the meaning comes, comes out, right? It comes out based on how you're looking at different words uh, from these lists. Okay, so this is an example of a rhyming scheme. I think this is actually, it comes from an actual uh, sonnet, okay, and uh, this is a, a good example to uh, refer to when you're looking at examples of the rhyming scheme for the sonnet. And let's see what else. Um, okay, this they show they do talk about another type, um, but just disregard this type of sonnet. Again, we're only going to focus on the Shakespearean sonnet, uh, looking at the rhyming scheme that we just talked about. We will not use this rhyming scheme here. You, so you can just kind of go over, just ignore this part. Now, the second aspect, the iambic pentameter, this is probably the most challenging, right? The rhyming is, is it could be considered challenging, but I think the iambic pentameter, the stress uh, is uh, the most difficult. All right, so iambic pentameter, we've got two words here, iambic and pentameter. So iambic simply means a group of two syllables, the first being uh, a weak syllable or a non-stressed syllable, and the second syllable being stressed. That's all iambic means. It's a fancy word for da 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 That's an iambic, two syllables weak, strong, or no stress, and then a stress. Da-da, da-da. Pentameter simply means 
we're going to have in each line five iambics. Each line of your sonnet will have five iambics. So if an iambic is da da, if you have five of those, it's going to be da 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 da. That's your stress for each line. Each of the fourteen lines of a sonnet should follow iambic pentameter. Da 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 da. That's the second line. Third line. Da 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 da. Fourth line. Da 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 da. Right. That's it. That's iambic pentameter. Now here, they try to show you ways to, I guess, pronounce pronunciate uh, this the stress. Ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. Right. So that is kind of a weak or unstressed syllable, and then followed by a stressed syllable. Ba bum, the Mets. That's an iambic. The Mets, because we don't say the Mets. I mean, that's actually funny because well. There's a Saturday night, Saturday Night Live sketch that they actually pronounce it that way. But anyway, and that's what makes it funny, right? Because normally when we say the Mets, we say it weak strong. We don't say the Mets, the Mets, right? And in normal circumstances, right? So the, what they're trying to, what he's explaining in this video, and he shows some good examples of iambic pentameter, five right? And I ams, and you have in a single line, my cat is eating casserole and cake. My cat is eating casserole and cake. That's iambic pentameter. There are five iams, I should say, not iambics, but there are five iams, right? My cat is eating casserole and cake. Now notice all the normal stresses, eating casserole, casserole, Everything is following in and hitting the, the normal stress of each of the words. My cat, my cat, my cat is eating casserole and cake. So this is what we're going to be dealing with when we write each of our lines. How can we create a meaningful line and follow iambic pentameter and also respect the normal stress of the word. I can't pronounce eating. Like, in fact, he does something funny here. He actually changes this to show you what not to do. Right? So this is, again, this is the right way. My cat is eating casserole and cake. See that? My, my cat is eating. That's the correct way. But then he turns it around. And it's actually funny because now this is the wrong way. We wouldn't say my cat is eating casserole and cake. Right? That would be the, the opposite. And that's what it sounds like when we don't hit the normal stress of certain words. Maybe it's not this extreme as this example, but there are going to be times where we, we have certain words we want to use. We want to use casserole, but it doesn't quite fit because of the words that come either before or after. And so we have to kind of experiment and change around the words so that casserole is fits right within the iambic pentameter, the stress pattern of each line. And this, I think, is the most challenging part, right? Iambic pentameter, the stress. So. Really pay close attention not only to iambic pentameter, but also the normal stress of certain words. When we say eating, for example, it's strong, weak. It's not weak, strong. Eating, casserole, casserole, not casserole. And so if it helps to use a dictionary to find those stresses, make sure you use those. I think in most cases we, can, we are familiar enough with the words that we know uh, where the stresses are but we have to pay attention to how we're, or where we're putting them in each line, okay? Iambic pentameter. All right, and these are some, some examples. Again, I recommend that you take a, a look at this video. This is another example of iambic All right, now the content. Now the content. All right, so 
We write a sonnet usually to praise someone or something, right? So this is really the purpose of usually of developing a, a sonnet, right? We want to show appreciation to someone or something through the use of the sonnet, through the use of writing this long poem with all of these rules, but we want to express gratitude. And so try to keep this in mind. One of the reasons why I ask you guys to share yesterday in the post, the person or the thing or the object that you want is so that you started reflecting on what are all the, the small things about this person or thing or this object that really means something to you so that you can start thinking about how those thoughts, those ideas and feel this person or thing or object, bring that into some sort of uh, creative writing experience, writing it in, in the form of a we're going to be praising someone or something, and let me see if I can move. Oops, sorry. Hear me? I'm going to make sure. Yes, teacher. Okay. All right. Um, sorry about that. All right, so. Here we have the content, the sections, okay? I, I mentioned before, we've got three quatrains in one couplet, all right? This is how we're gonna re, uh, refer to these four lines, each of these four lines, okay? So we won't call it a stanza in this case, we're gonna call it a quatrain. Uh, well, one of the reasons is because it has four lines, all right? So we have four quatrains, and we'll have one couplet at the end. I think he mentions that, yeah, well, the couplet is at the at the end there. Now, you'll notice here, I think we mentioned the voltra or the turn or the twist. I think it was in the tanka, right? Well, guess what? We're going to have a volta or a turn or a twist in our sonnet. All right, so you're going to be, what normally happens is the first two quatrains is usually something positive because you're praising this person, you're showing appreciation. Usually it's something that you are um, talking about in a positive light. And then what, what usually happens in the third quatrain from the first line, okay? So this is line number nine, if you want to count from the very beginning, from the very top. Line number nine or as you begin the third quatrain, there is some sort of turn or twist. And one of the best words to use for your turn or twist or volta is the connector, but, but, All right? So I, I would use, if everyone uses that one word on line nine to begin line nine, that I have no problem with that, all right? It's a good word to kind of turn the tables, so to speak, to turn the, the story. So it's all good and it's all positive about the person. And then maybe in the third quad train, there's something. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go super negative and this person's horrible. Of course not. But, uh, you know, maybe there's something else interesting about the person that's a little bit different or off, you know, that you can share because the last two lines, the, two, the, the couplet at the end, that's when you're going to return back and everything's sunny again, everything's great, all right? So uh, look at it like, basically, I, I think I mentioned earlier two parts. It's actually three parts. The first two quad trains is mainly positive. You're praising the person. The third quad train, slightly, there's a twist. There's some sort of turn that's going on. And then the couplet, you come back home, everything's good, right? It kind of, you go back to uh, your, the meaning, the overall vibe, I guess, uh, of the first two quiet trains in the last couplet. Okay, so think of it like a, in these terms, it's not necessarily a story. Remember that you're praising this person or this thing or this object. So it's not necessarily a story as it is your, um, basically your feelings about this thing, this person, um, in, in, in this type of structure. 
Okay, so this is more or less the form, the structure of the of the poem. And I would also throw in this category of the content and the structure, the use of figurative language. The use of figurative language. We need to have several examples of different types of figurative language. Okay, and they can occur anywhere in any part of the line, part of the line. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the entire line. It depends on what kind of figurative language it is. But we want to try to sprinkle figurative language throughout. That's really going to bring out and improve, I think, our, our poem. Because, again, this is creative writing. This is not a very literal uh, account of this person. This is... Uh, something that should articulate some feelings, some emotions. Think of the five senses again, right? Think about what something or someone or some object not only looks like, what do they feel like? What do they smell like? What do they taste like? What are they? What are all the different um, the senses that we can bring into our poem to? to uh, to talk about for for this particular uh, poem all right so think about the five senses think about the different examples of figurative language that you can use in your po poetry all right so the rest of this is more just basically talking more about what we're what i've addressed here and we're talking about the turn i think those are the main points i wanted to address when looking at, uh, when thinking about the poem. All right, um, any questions? I know there's a lot of information here. Are there any questions about what I, what I covered in terms of the structure or iambic pentameter or rhyming schemes? Yes, this are right. Uh-huh, go ahead. Um, this year, um, how many words or syllables and had each sentence. All right, so what do you guys think? I'll turn that to the whole group. How many syllables? And I, I, I won't use the word sentence. I'll try. I'll use the word line. There are going to be 14 lines. So how many syllables will there be in each line of a sonnet? Any ideas? Maybe seven. Seven? Anybody else? How many syllables? Because that's a good question. And I didn't specifically say I didn't specifically say, but I indirectly said how many syllables in each line. Anybody else have an idea? How many syllables should go in each line? of our 14 line sonnet. Any ideas? Let me ask another question. Can someone define iambic pentameter? We have to use syllables that are strong and are weak, weak, strong, weak, strong. All right. And anyone else? Can anyone else add to to that? Defining about well, iambic pentameter because we have basically two words there. So what does each word mean? And Elizabeth's on the right track, but what, what else can you say if you had to define those two words, iambic and then pentameter? What does iambic mean?
All right, iambic pentameter is five iams. Now, what is an iam? Ba bum. Right. So remember that when we have iambic pentameter, an iam is simply two syllables. One that's weak, the first one is weak, the second one is strong, or the first one is unstressed, the second is stressed. That's an I am. I A M B, an I am. Okay, just has two syllables, dead on. That's an I am. Now, pentameter, right, if you think of a pentagon, right, means simply you have five I am's. So if an IM has two syllables and each line has five IMs, how many syllables are gonna ha are we gonna have in each line? Ten. Ten. That's right. So here's what it sounds like. And you can use your fingers if you want. Da 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 da. That's one line. Here's the second line. Da 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 da. Here's the third line. Da 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 da. We're gonna do that fourteen times. Da 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 da. That's one line. Da 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 da. Those are ten syllables, all following what's called iambic pentameter. Weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong. Second line, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong. Does that make sense? Iambic pentameter, 10 syllables, but don't think of it as like, oh, just 10 syllables, quoquet, right? Whatever, whatever words, just throw them in there. It's da 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 All right, so, all right, so, I don't know if they have a full example here in the uh, in the video, but I would start with watching the video if you need to, right? Um, there are many examples. Some of the older examples that you find online, especially if you're looking at Shakespearean sonnets, they're going to be older um, uh, uses of the English language, right? So they're some of the pronunciations we're not going to recognize. And so you may ask yourself, well, this doesn't rhyme, right? Or how does this rhyme? And so, um, yeah, take a, a look at some of the older examples. I mean, if you just search the internet, you can find um, um, tons of examples of sonnets. But some of the older sonnets may not be recognizable in terms of the rhyming schemes because words change. The way that they are pronounced changes over time. If you look at and compare you know, Middle English to current in English, for example. Um, but here's one tip that that you can follow here that um, that might help you get started. Now, some every time I I share this tip, only a few students find it find it useful. But I do want to sh provide this as an option, um, and what this the what you can do is you can find one of your favorite sonnets. So let's look at this one. Now, again, the trick is to find one that's exactly like the Shakespearean sonnet in terms of the rhyming scheme. So let's look at this. Days, haze, light, bright, bitterness, confess, sweet, meat, love, before, me. Yeah, so this doesn't, this is not the best example. You really want to try to find a, a rhyming scheme, as we've seen, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, and so on. Um, show, no, pain, obtain, woe, flow, entertain, brain, stay, way, blows, throws. Okay, this one works. All right, let's say that this, and what I did first is I just double-checked first to check that it respected the, the correct or the rhyming scheme that we need for, for our purposes. And it does in this example. So one of the things you could do, and this is just to help you with the rhyme, all right? You would take this example 
and use not the same words, but the same sounds. All right. So, for example, you would say show, and then you would write out the longest list you could write out for show how many different words rhyme with show. And you could come up with a lot of words that rhyme with the word show. Then create another list of words that rhyme with pain. Pain, and of course, obtain, right? And then sane and uh, all the other words that you can find out that, that you can find that rhyme with these words. And then do use the same rhyming scheme. That is, the first and three, third line it would be some word that rhymes <clears throat> with the word show, right? So it might, maybe it's bow, so, S-O-W. <clears throat> and so the idea here is you can use an example of a sonnet to help you come up with different rhyming schemes, but again, not using the same words. And then you can go in and change obviously change these lines and create your own right your own um your own poem but this is one way that i uh, that i think is easy kind of to so you don't have to find different words you've already got a good start on coming up with certain words that you can use and play with basically and i would start with those lists i'm a big f proponent of creating these long lists, these several different word uh, lists that rhyme. And then you can, because a lot of times you're going to get good ideas. Some of these words are going to relate to each other depending on the, the message that you want to send. And it's just a matter of combining your message, what you want to say, how you want to praise this person or thing or object versus the word list that you have and bringing those together. Again, it's like a puzzle. You want to try to bring that in and then combine that with a list of some examples of figurative language. I would start coming up with some of your uh, favorite examples of figurative language and ones that have certain meanings that you want to bring in and, um, and then just try to put it all together. Okay, so this is what I would do to begin, right? So if that helps, great, do it. If it if it's more confusing that way, then then that's fine. You don't have to do it. But uh, try to keep that in mind here that we've got three things we have to deal with with the sonnet. We've got the rhyming scheme, iambic pentameter, and then we have content and structure. That is, we've got certain uh, things that we need to say in the first two quadrants. Then we have a turn or a twist in the third uh, quatrain, should say quatrain. And then the couplet at the end is going to return back kind of our summary, kind of our uh, coming back uh, home moment and uh, finalizing th our praise for, for this person or thing or object. Teacher, maybe you have mentioned it, but I'm kind of confused or I'm lost to be honest. How many syllables in each line? Ten syllables in each line. Ten. And it mm -hmm. should be a strong wick? That's correct. Da -da 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 that's that's a quad that's an iambic pentameter. That's a one line. All right. Um let's look at let me see if I can find another example. Like, look at this first line here. One day I wrote her name upon the strand. All right, see how that fits? It fits because we're stressing what? What words are we stressing? One day I wrote her name upon the strand. What words are we rhyming? Or not rhyming, what words are we stressing? One day I wrote her name upon the strand. Anyone? What do you think? Which words am I stressing in the first line? One day I wrote her name upon the strand. 
Can you hear the stress? Jay, Rose. Mm -hmm. Wait. Jay wrote name. Uh huh. Uh, the second the pawn. Like right. Pawn. Like on a, of a pawn, right? Pawn and strand. That's right. All right, and that's how that's how it should flow. Now, some of the examples that you find, that's why um, I don't want to spend a lot of examples looking, a lot of time looking at examples, because some of these examples are better than others. But this is a good line. One day I wrote her name upon the strand. It just, that it flows because we're stressing more content words, right? I'm not stressing I in, in one we wouldn't want to stress that in one day. It's We would say one day. We don't say one day. One day, usually. We say one day. And then we usually say, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote. I don't say, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote. We say, I wrote her name, her name, right? Weak, strong, her name, her name. Upon, of course. That's the normal stress of upon to two syllables. Weak, strong, the strand, the strand. The strand, right? Weak, strong. All right, so that's the idea. Five, uh, five I am. So we have basically, we have uh, 10 syllables in each line, 14 lines, three quatrains, followed by a couplet. Okay, any other questions about the sonnet or the structure of the sonnet or the rhyming scheme? No, teacher, thank you. No? All right. So um, we've got a few more minutes here. I just want to show you, if you're still looking here at my screen, week 15. Uh, here's where you'll find the video. So if you do need to watch the video, you can find it there. Under activities, here's where we're going to be working over the next uh, couple of weeks in our wiki called Sonnet. This is an individual wiki. Again, uh, as we've done in the past, just hit, click create a page. Don't change anything here. Leave everything as is. And this will take you right into your wiki. And this is where you can develop your, your sonnet. All right. And as you're developing your sonnet, again, as always, uh, the key, I think, is to try to receive some feedback throughout the process, especially this poem. If you guys are developing this without getting any feedback for two weeks, well, I don't know. I think I would feel more comfortable in my final reading if I had uh, several conversations, not only with me, but also your classmates looking at each other's work and making progress and, and, and receiving feedback. So we're going to have um, probably this Thursday or Friday, depending on how things go, for, certainly by Friday, I would like for us to have at least one quad train for for the sonnet, and then that way we can look at that and discuss them and kind of compare and see how we're doing and get some feedback. So that will help you going forward, hopefully, with the remaining uh, quad trains and the couplet. Okay. All right. Any other questions, guys, about about the sonnet? Again, uh, no, anybody? Teacher. Yes, go ahead. No, teacher. I uh, know. Okay. Uh, again, you guys can choose whomever you want. Um, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, if you want to talk about one person or a group of people or an object or a, or, or an animal or a pet, uh, but do make it uh, something or someone that is uh, significant uh, to you, so it has some sort of uh, emotional attachment, so that you have. A drive here uh, to to write the the sonnet, and um, tomorrow in class we'll have uh, time to take our second review of the figurative language, and uh, Thursday we'll continue working in class, um, and um, we'll 
continue working on that and I'll probably come up with some I'll try to come up with some additional examples of sonnets if those help. Uh, but I, I want to be very careful with the types of sonnets simply because there are many different variations of sonnets that uh, are avail or that are out there. And um, but we'll I'll bring in a few uh, examples that are very specific to what uh, to what we're doing. All right, any other final comments or questions? No, teacher, thank you. All right, I think we'll go ahead and stop there. Again, feel free to take a look at the video, continue uh, preparing for tomorrow's review, and um, I think we'll stop there for, for today. All right, thanks, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you guys uh, tomorrow morning. Bye, teacher. Okay, teacher, bye. Bye. Bye, teacher, thank you.